to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In Luke chapter 24, verse number 44, our Lord said, All things must be fulfilled, which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Psalms as we're going to be thinking about Jesus Christ and the prophecies that relate to him in the book of Psalms and some other encouraging verses for the child of God in Psalms as well. We're so glad that you've joined us today for our study. Hope you've got your Bible handy. If you don't have your Bible with you, we want you to locate it, take a minute to locate it, have it out and ready, as we're going to let God in His Word give us the guidance today. Friend, today's lesson is being brought to you by loving members of the Churches of Christ and congregations of the Lord's Church in your area. We'd love for you to stop by and visit the Lord's Church. If you're not a member of the Lord's Church and you'd like to know more about the church, Maybe talk to someone about the plan of salvation. Maybe study with someone about worship or any Bible subject. We encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. You will find people there who love God, who are concerned about lost souls, and who more than anything want to point people to God and His Word to help them endure and receive that heavenly home. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we also want to help you in your study of God's Word. We want you to visit our website. We want to encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, you can access all of our material free of charge. We have over 500 lessons in both video and audio and written transcripts, have a host of good Bible study materials. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson on Psalms or any book of the Old or New Testament and a variety of topical studies, we make those available to you free of charge. Just go to our website. Fill out a media request form. You can receive that immediately as a digital download, or if you need a copy on DVD or CD, we'd be happy to make that available to you as well. Just contact us, write to us, email us, call us at the information given, and we'd be happy to help you in your study of God's Word in any way that we can. And friend, our aim, our whole aim and mission is simply to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We want people to be saved, and thus, as we think today about the book of Psalms, we want to point people to Jesus in the Psalms. Let's begin by thinking about some of the Psalms that are particularly dealing with Christ and His kingdom and some of the events that would happen in His life. I want to ask you to open first to Psalm chapter 2. As we open to the book of Psalms and as we think about some of the things concerning Christ in them, Psalm chapter 2 is what we might think of as a psalm where Jesus is going to be anointed or coronated as king. Listen to Psalm chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. The psalmist says, Why do the nations rage, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take get counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, or His Christ, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Look in verse number 9. Of that kingdom it is said, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. That passage itself, Psalm 2 verse 9, is quoted multiple times in the book of Revelation and quoted directly by Jesus in Revelation 2 of His kingdom and His power. You know, when you think back 
to the gospel accounts. Herod, the Jews, Pilate, uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, or the religious lead of Jesus' day, they did everything they could to thwart God's plan. They, they did everything possible, even in their mind, to the point of killing Jesus Christ to make sure He didn't take their power. And yet, here are the nations, and they're raging. Here are the people, they're saying, let us break these cords, let us destroy this plan. And it's as though God in heaven is laughing at them. He holds them in derision. They think their plan is going to come to fruition, but actually God is using them to bring the Messiah, to bring salvation, and to bring His kingdom into the world. He'll crush them in pieces like a potter's vessel or he'll break it with that rod of iron. Man's plans weren't going to stand up against Christ and God's ultimate plan. And Jesus is still King of kings and Lord of lords today. And so we have kind of an anointing or coronation psalm of Jesus and his kingdom beginning in Psalm 2. Then we have a resurrection psalm. Look in your Bible in Psalm 16, and I want you to see what is said about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look in Psalm 16, and I want you to look in verses 8 through 11. The Lord says, I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. Why? Quoted in Acts 2.31, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the paths of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. As Peter stands up, on the day of Pentecost with the other disciples and they by the power of the Holy Spirit preach Jesus as the Messiah, he begins to prove that from the scriptures. God predetermined him. God appointed him. Look at all the things he did. And then he says on top of that, you want to hold up David and David's been long dead. And yet the Messiah, Jesus Christ, it is said of him in Acts 2.31, He'll not leave my soul in Sheol. Death would have no power over him. And that is quoted and directly applied to Jesus Christ. And friend, we know the story. Mark 16, 1, Luke chapter 24, they go to that tomb. They see the, the empty tomb. They hear the words, He is not here. He is risen. And death could not hold. Jesus Christ, He has risen from the grave. He is at the right hand of the Father, Hebrews 1 verse 4, and that resurrection, that's what gives us hope. Do you remember John 11, verses 24 and 25? Jesus said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, Jesus said, though he may die, He'll live. And if you live and believe me, you'll, you'll never really die, Jesus said. Friend, the Christian, because of the resurrection of Christ, death's been conquered. Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 14. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55, uh, 51 through 57. I don't have to live because of what the Messiah, Christ, my Lord, has done. I no longer have to live in fear of death. And the Psalms beautifully portray that idea. All right then, we've thought about his coronation, being anointed as king. We've thought about his resurrection as we've looked at Psalm 16. Now I want you to see some prophecies about the death and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Would you open your Bible to Psalm 22 with me? Psalm 22 is one of the most graphic Psalms predicting the death and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Look at some of these verses. Look in Psalm 22, verse number 1. The psalmist says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me. And of course, we hear those words in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse number 46, and Mark 15, verse number 34. My God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? When Jesus is on the cross, he cries that out. And seven, 750, a thousand years before that, 
The psalmist had already said those words would be echoed in the life of Jesus. Continue with me in Psalm chapter 22. Look in verses 6 through 8. The psalmist says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And of course, you open to Matthew 27, verse 43. And here's Jesus on the cross. Uh, and as the people come by, they began to mock him. They began to say, just like years before, hundreds of years before the psalmist said, if he's the Christ, he save others, let him save himself. Let him now come down from the cross. My friend, that's exactly what we don't need to happen. It's the cross that saves men. But look at what was promised and prophesied many hundreds of years in Psalm 22 before it actually happened. All right, look a little further. Psalm 22. Look in verses 14 and 15. The psalmist says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. The psalmist would say, you have brought me. You have brought me to the dust of death. You know, when I think about these ideas, I think of Jesus on the cross. And I think of those ever memorable words where Jesus said, I thirst. My tongue clings to my mouth. I'm dried up as it were. And Jesus said that I'm thirst. John 19, uh, uh, Matthew 27, Mark 15, we hear of that. Again, prophesied hundreds of years before it actually happened. And Jesus echoes those words on the cross. Look at another verse with me. Look in Psalm 22. Verses 16 through 18. The psalmist says, For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. Listen to this. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. You know, you can't help but think of the events of Golgotha and again, the cross here. Jesus' hands and feet were nailed to that cross in, in John 19 and Matthew 27. And instead of, instead of uh, doing away with Jesus, they cast lots for his garments. They divided it and they cast lots for it. And of course, we read that again in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. How is it that everything the psalmist said 750, 800, maybe a thousand years before Jesus comes on the scene. How is it that many years before the Christ comes, everything the psalmist said happens in exacting detail? Well, friend, that's a great proof, number one, that Jesus is the Messiah. And secondly, that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. And so when I think about these passages, I can't help but think of what Jesus went through what he suffered for me and you, and how the Psalms clearly told us it would be just that way. Now I want you to see a, a kingly Psalm about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Actually, two of them. Look in your Bible in Psalm 72, and look at here how Jesus, by God, is anointed as the ultimate king. Look at Psalm 72, verse number 1. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. Look at verse 11. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Look at verse 17. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed can't help but think of the words of Revelation 17. King of kings, Lord of lords. Can't help but think of Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. There's a day coming where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Christ to the glory of God the Father, the King's Son, God's Son. 
was going to be anointed as the ultimate great king that one day all men would bow down in front of. Look at a second kingly psalm. Look at Psalm 110. I want you to turn over to Psalm 110, and this one is quoted nearly as much as any psalm in the New Testament. Psalm 110, I want you to look at verse 1, and then we'll look at verse number 4. The psalmist David says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. In Acts chapter 2 and in other places, this is applied to Jesus Christ. The Lord, David's Lord, said to him, O Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Well, who is that? That would be identified as the Christ, the Messiah, the one who's greater than David. And so, again, you kind of have the idea of the ultimate king here. But then I want you to see a psalm that is mentioned multiple times in the book of Hebrews. And this is the priestly psalm about Jesus. Look at Psalm 110, verse number 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent to the Messiah. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so when I think about everything that's written in the book of Psalms, and there are many more that we could mention, but everything that's written in the book of Psalms clearly applied to Jesus. Not a Levitical priest. He's of the order of Melchizedek, appointed by God, no beginning or end, remains a priest continually, offers the greatest sacrifice that could ever be offered himself to save us from our sins. Truly, we can say, as Luke 24, verse 44 prophesied, all things about the Messiah in the Psalms have indeed been fulfilled. Now, for just our remaining time, let's take a few moments, and I want to offer again some encouragement for the child of God to be found in the Psalms. You know, a lot of people in their devotional reading, in their daily Bible reading, like to read from the Psalms. It's such an encouraging uplifting book to read every day. And I want to share with you just two or three psalms that are, are really powerful psalms that uplift the child of God. The first psalm teaches us who the happy man is. Would you open your Bible to Psalm 1? I want you to look in Psalm chapter 1. It's just a short psalm, but look with me in verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, Blessed or happy is the man who walks not in the counts of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But happy is the idea, is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper." The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Who's going to be the really happy person, blessed or happy, is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of ungodly, doesn't sit in the sit at see the scornful, doesn't stand in the path of sinners, but listen to this, but happy is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Well, illustrate that for me, would you? He'll be like the tree that's planted by the rivers of water, takes deep roots, has much nourishment, produces good fruit, is a good, strong, stable tree that is not likely to be moved. Deep-rooted, has good nourishment. That's the idea of the Christian. When I put my trust in God, when I put my trust in, home, in Him, God delights in that, and my life is going to be richly blessed for trusting and hoping in Almighty God. Here's another very beautiful psalm. Would you open your Bible to Psalm 8 with me? I want you to see just how much God cares for me and just how much God cares for you. This is such an humbling psalm. Look at Psalm 8 with me. The psalmist says this, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. 
out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Now listen to this. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit or take care of him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. When you talk about bringing humility to our hearts, go out at night. Look at the stars. Look at the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the, 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 the sun, the moon, which you've made. When I look at all of God's handiwork that He created, and then I look at man, what am I? What is man that God thinks about him so much? Why does God take care of us? Friend, we are different than everything else. Man is different than everything else God created, and here's how. God said... Let us make man in our image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And the Lord God took and made man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. God made me in his image. And God placed a living soul inside of me and inside of you. Friend, how wonderful it is to know that the God of heaven cares so deeply for us that we are the pinnacle of His creation, so much so that God sent His Son to die for me and to die for you. All right, probably the most well-known psalm. And yes, it is indeed encouraging. Look with me in Psalm chapter 23. Friend, as we think about psalms that encourage and uplift us, Psalm 23 is at the top of that list. Listen to these words. The psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, the shepherd boy, thinks back to himself now as a sheep and to God being the good shepherd. God has been so good to every one of us. How He has cared for, how He has provided for us, how He has helped us in this life, even when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, even when there is great difficulty and problems, even to the point of death. I don't have to fear. Why? God's with me. His staff, His rod, they take care of me. God prepares the table. God takes care of everything I need. And thus, that motivates us to want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And with that in mind, look at who can dwell in God's house. Would you look with me in just one psalm over to Psalm chapter 24? Look at Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. The psalmist said, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, who can do that? Psalm 24 tells us, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Isn't that a beautiful image? Who has, he who has clean hands and a pure heart? That's the one who can dwell with God forever. That's the one who can live in the presence of Almighty God, who's not used his lips in an ungodly way, not sworn to something that he shouldn't have. Friend, the person who's trying to live like God wants him to live, 
None of us are perfect. I understand that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. None righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. But as we strive to walk in the light, 1 John 1, verse 7, as we strive to live a life that brings glory and honor to God, isn't it good to know that we'll one day live with God forever? Isn't it good to know that in this life we have the best life, John 10, verse 10, and that we have help from Almighty God? And so as we've thought about the book of Psalms today, Friend, I want to ask you to think more about Jesus in your life. We've seen that He fulfilled everything written about Him in the Psalms. He is the Savior of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, verse number 6. What about you? Have you submitted your will to the One who has completely fulfilled every Scripture? To the One who allowed Himself, His hands and His feet to be pierced on that cross, allowed people to look up and mock Him, allowed people to divide His garments? Have you submitted to the One who gave His life for you? Friend, we want you to know today that the God of heaven loves you immensely. God wants all men to be saved, and that includes me and that includes you. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, God doesn't want anybody to perish, 2 Peter 3, verse number 9. We urge you today, if you're not a child of God, won't you submit your life to Jesus Christ? What an encouragement it's been to study the Psalms and to think about everything God has done to uplift His people. Are you one of His people? Do you believe Jesus is the Christ? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin in repentance? Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. Would you confess Jesus with your mouth as the Savior? Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And having done that, would you be immersed in, immersed in water to have your sins washed away? Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more from God's divine word. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.